Well, grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. So if you haven't picked up on it already, it was VBS this past week. And the sort of week-long theme of VBS was Mystery Island, hoo-ha, Mystery Island, who. And we were tracking down the one true God. So we went on a journey on Mystery Island and we learned some really great things about our one true God. Some of those things I just shared with you through the children's message. But we're going to go into those into a little more depth. So the first day we learned that God is great. God is great. So great, in fact, that there can only be be one. Now, I don't know if anybody out there has watched Highlander. I personally haven't watched too much of it, but you probably recognize that phrase, there can only be one. Well, that's true about God, too. And the kids learn that God is so great, we don't need any other gods besides him. And they learned this story from what we, you guys just heard in your epistle reading with Paul, reading and preaching about Jesus in the Areopagus in Athens. Right, Athens, Greece would have been one of the world's foremost central places of thinking and progress. And when Paul gets there, the text says that his spirit is provoked because he sees all of these other gods. And yet he knows, like we do, there's only one. And so he endeavors to tell them about this one God. Now... For us, monotheism, or the worship of one God, seems sort of normal. We're used to that. But in the ancient world, monotheism stood out from all the other pagan religions around. They had a full pantheon of gods, many different gods to address all the different needs in the world. Gods of nature, gods of science and progress, gods of magic, gods of the harvest, gods of wine. The list goes on and on. Maybe many of you have studied about this this set of gods in particular that come from Greece, like Zeus and Jupiter and Apollo and Aphrodite and all those names. So when Paul comes in and he starts talking about, no, there's really only one God. And not only that, but he tells them this really strange and bizarre story that God descended to earth in the form of this man named Jesus. Now, if you've had some classes about Greek mythology, you've, you probably know that the story of a god taking on the form of a human isn't quite alien, but to actually become one would be. So then when Paul talks about this man, this God-man, Jesus actually dying, that's when they start to wonder if this person is crazy or not, because gods don't die. But we'll come back to that. The second day they learn that God is almighty. So we got to teach them some big fancy words. All the omni words. If you're familiar with the three big omni words about God. Omniscient, all-knowing. Omnipotent, all-powerful. And omnipresent, that God is everywhere all the time. And the story that exemplified this was the story of Jonah. So you heard one of the kids in the video say that they learned that Jonah was swallowed by a big fish. Right? Well, to give you some context for that, the almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present God, in that story, Jonah's trying to run away from him. Which, when you learn that God is all-powerful and all-knowing and everywhere, doesn't make a lot of sense. But he does it anyways, and if we're honest, sometimes we try to run away from God too. If you're familiar with the story of Jonah, you know that God calls Jonah to go to a city and to tell that city that unless they change their ways, God is going to destroy them. And Jonah doesn't particularly like the people of that city. He doesn't seem to care about them that much, and so he doesn't want to go. We can relate to that somewhat. Sometimes God calls us to do things, and we don't want to do them either. They're difficult. Or maybe God is asking us to care or love somebody that we don't really wish 
to do that for her. So Jonah tries to run and it doesn't work so well. He tries to escape on a ship and God raises a giant storm until he, can, he has to tell the ship members to throw him overboard, otherwise the ship will sink. And that's where Jonah gets swallowed by the big fish and then gets spit out on the shore after three days and three nights. Right outside, wouldn't you guess, at the city that God wanted him to go to all along. Turns out running from God doesn't work very well. But the other thing to notice during that story is even though Jonah didn't want to go, God does not attack Jonah. In fact, he uses his power to protect and guide him to where he wants him to go. Because you would think if you get swallowed by a giant fish in the ocean, you're done for. But the Lord watches over him and protects him and brings him where he wants him to go. Which sort of begs the question, then, how does God use this almighty power for us? We got to day three, and that's where we learn how God uses his power for us. God is Emmanuel. Emmanuel is a word that means God with us. And up to this point... Everything seems sort of normal for even our own understanding of what a God ought to be like. Right? A God is obviously great. That's one of the things that makes them a God. And being all-powerful, all-knowing, and ever-present, that just sort of comes with the territory, right? But here's where Christians get weird. Here's where we say things that nobody else does. Here's where we say bizarre things that the world doesn't understand. That God is with us in Emmanuel. We had a little Christmas in July celebration, as you'll probably see in some of the pictures. Had some Christmas hats on our uh, red and green day. And that was because we were talking about the birth of our Savior, Jesus. For this is, in fact, God is Emmanuel, is Jesus. God sending his Son, fully God and fully man, to be among his people to work the God's plan of salvation. Now think about that for one moment. And let me set up the stage for that decision. So God created a perfect universe, all that's in it, and then he created man and woman. And he gave us one rule, and we disobeyed that rule and made ourselves enemies of God and corrupted all of his creation. We routinely run away from him like Jonah and don't want to do what he asks. And yet, in the midst of all that, our almighty, all-powerful God sends Jesus for the express purpose of saving people who are actively fighting against him. You can imagine the Athenians in the Areopagus hearing something like that and wondering, that's not very godlike behavior. That sounds like humiliation. And they would be right. That's exactly what it is. God humbles himself, taking on the form of a man, not merely the form, but becoming a man born under the law in order to enact God's plan of salvation for you and me. This is what God uses his almighty power for, to save you and me by giving it up. Obviously, that Truth is fully exemplified by the cross, where Jesus most fully gives up his power and is forsaken by God and dies the death that we deserve. Day four, God is trustworthy. Now, I don't know about any of you, but I wasn't present on that hill outside of Jerusalem. I've never met Jesus like I met you So how do I know that all this amazing stuff that someone like Paul is saying or someone like me is saying is actually true? I mean, it sounds like crazy talk. Why would God do something like that? So we learn that God is trustworthy, that he keeps his promises. And we learned that through the story of David and Goliath. Now, a lot of times people will say that David and Goliath is about facing the giants in your life. That's not really what David and Goliath is about. Because David doesn't actually do the fighting 
God does. That's why David isn't afraid, even though he's so much smaller than his adversary. Even though he's not wearing any armor, he doesn't have any majorly huge weapons. All he's got are some smooth stones and a sling. But he knows the God, the one true God, is on his side. And so you heard in the reading the promise he makes to Goliath. That he is going to be victorious, not over him only, but over the whole Philistine army. And the Philistines were a much bigger kingdom than Israel was at the time. In other words, what's really going on in the story of David and Goliath is answering the question, who is the true king? Right? There's a king of the Israelites, his name is Saul. And when Goliath comes out and taunts the armies of Israel, where is Saul? He's hiding in his tent, afraid, not doing the thing a king ought to be doing, which is standing up and protecting his people. But it's a good thing for Israel and it's a good thing for us that our true king is no human being but God. And David knew this truth, something that everybody else there seemed to have forgotten in their fear. And so I almost sort of find the scene funny where he's looking around, this young man, not of any particularly large stature, and he's like, why is nobody challenging this guy? Are you going to let him talk about our God in that way? And you can imagine the looks he received, but he trusted in God because he believed that God was good to his word, that he would protect his people, that he would deliver victory. And of course we know in David's case, he did. Well, there's an even greater challenge and an even greater victory that we know of, and that is the challenge of sin and death and the devil, and the victory over all three of those enemies in Jesus. As much as David was able to trust in the promises of God, Jesus trusted in them even more perfectly, perfectly trusted in God's plan of salvation, even though the entire time he knows what it will cost him. Forsaken by God, death on a cross, the ridicule of those very people he comes to save. But he goes anyways, because our almighty God, the one true great God of the universe, sent Jesus for that very purpose, to save us from our sins. So those were the week, those were the days of this past week for VBS. A simple and straightforward message of the scriptures of an awesome and mighty and all-powerful God who gives all that up to save you. Who loves you even though you're unlovable. Who redeems you even though you're irredeemable. Now the first part of the, the week would have made tons of sense to the Athenians and anyone else who's had any serious thoughts about God. But that day three, we take a strange turn because this almighty God gives up his almighty power, not for some grand, noble, or worthy cause, but for you and me. No wonder the Greeks are confused And so many of them think that Paul is crazy. Maybe you've had that reaction when you've told somebody about Jesus. That's okay. Because just like David, you're not the one doing the fighting. God is doing it. His word speaks for itself, and it is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. And so, like Paul, we share it. Trusting that this almighty and all-powerful God who knows all things really did come down to heaven to be among his people, gave up all of his divine power on the cross and died the death that you deserved. And through the wondrous gifts he's given the church in the sacrament of baptism and the Lord's Supper, that victory is yours. No longer are you doomed to die an eternal death. Jesus took that punishment in your place. Now you are fated. Eternal life 
in the kingdom of heaven. Luther calls this the glorious exchange. And I think that's probably the biggest understatement there is. So that's what the kids at VBS learned this week. And I thought I'd share it with you. Because it's never too, there are never too many times you can be reminded of the basic, straightforward story of the scriptures. And the truth about your amazing God and what he has done for you. So we went on a journey on Mystery Island to find the one true God. And when we found him, or rather when he found us, he was even better than we could imagine. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until he comes again in glory to make all things new. Amen. Please rise.